Okay, well, Jin Dobri, everyone, or a good afternoon uh, from uh, sunny London. It's a beautiful day here in the UK, and I hope wherever you are as well, the sun is shining uh, on you. Of course, I would prefer to be in Wroclaw uh, today, but things were otherwise uh, our destiny. Nevertheless, it's a real pleasure to be uh, speaking to all of you, and I'd like to say a particular uh, big hello to my students and my colleagues at the University of Business uh, in Wroclaw. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me this afternoon um, for this presentation. I hope you'll find it uh, useful. And um, what I would like to say is a little about myself. I'm Rob Davidson, and as you can see, I am a professor uh, visiting the University of Business in Wroclaw. And uh, today I'm going to be speaking about uh, the younger generation of uh, business events uh, participants and what we have to do or what you have to do to satisfy them uh, and to provide events, business events, that they are interested in and that are successful for them. So I have a lot to say, but I don't want to be the only one who is uh, talking. So what I'd like to do is to suggest that um, if you have a question, and I hope you have, at the end, I will stop talking about 15 minutes before the end, and I will look at your questions and, uh, and answer those for you. So I uh, hope that they're going to be in uh, English, that would make my life a lot easier because, you know, my Polish is not really 100%. Uh, so uh, let's go um, and speak about designing business events for the next generation. And of course, many of you watching, and I'm thinking especially of my students at the University of Business in Wroclaw, many of you are this next generation. So let us begin uh, by really uh, looking at uh, you and what we know about you. Um, but what I would say before we begin is if you like to, to tweet, if you are using uh, Twitter, there on the screen you can see my hashtag. It's very simple. Hashtag Mice Knowledge, the name of my company. So please don't hesitate to, to tweet about anything that you hear that you would like to share with other um, people. So let's um, move and look at demographics because really a lot of uh, today is about demographics and about uh, different generations in the, the workforce. Now I'm speaking about the workforce because these are business events and normally they are attended by people who are working, people in some uh, profession, some sector of the economy. That's why we're looking at the demographics of the workforce. Now, um, if we look <clears throat> at this slide, we can see that at the moment in the global workforce, there are one, two, three, four, five different generations. I'd like to briefly look at each one. Uh, the traditionalists, well, the traditionalists, most of them, of course, have retired. Not all. Some people are continuing to work. And we are still seeing people in their 70s and even their 80s coming to business events like conferences. The baby boomers, um, probably your parents, maybe your grandparents' generation. Um, that's an important generation. They have been uh, in power, in control for the last 30 or 40 years in control of business, in control of culture, in, con in control of politics. But that's changing fast. And the younger generations are taking their place because, as you can see, the older baby boomers have already retired and many others will be retiring in the next five or 10 years. Generation X, a small generation, for some reason, not so many people were born between 1961 and 1976. So if you're in that generation, you are a, you're a special person. And then we come to the two generations which are growing 
fastest in the global workforce, Generation Y, sometimes called millennials, and then the most recent uh, generation to enter the workforce, Generation Z. As you can see, the older members of Generation Z are already beginning their careers. So it's these last two generations that I want to focus on uh, in the next hour or so. If you're in Generation Y, well, congratulations. Uh, you are fast becoming the majority in the workforce as the baby boomers and Generation X are leaving the workforce more and more. Then Generation Y and followed by Generation Z are taking their places. And this is a, an amazing st statistic by 2025, which is tomorrow, three quarters of the world's workforce will be out of Generation Y. By 2025, it will be a Generation Y world, and we need to understand them. We also need to understand these people. And this is Business Life magazine from four years ago when Generation Z were first coming uh, into higher education and then into the workforce. Now, um, this is the generation which is very demanding, which needs to be uh, satisfied, Generation Z and Generation Y. And if we don't satisfy these generations, if business events do not adapt to what they want, then I'm sorry, we won't have business events. The, the, the industry will quietly go away and we don't want that uh, to happen. What do we know about this youngest uh, generation who are coming into the workforce? Well, they grew up in an insecure world. Even before the current pandemic, uh, Generation Z were the children of 9-11. Uh, they grew up in a world where insecurity was something uh, they encountered on a day-to-day -day basis um, in terms of high security in airports, for example, uh, they're used to insecurity. They're also very accepting of diversity. Uh, they are tolerant, tolerant generation. They don't see the difference between men and women, between the color of your skin, between different sexualities. They're very open-minded and very accepting of the world's diversity. Health conscious, very healthy, Generation Z, we know, do not smoke as much as previous generations, and they do not drink as much as, diff as previous generations, and they wait a lot longer before um, making love for the first time. We already know this from the statistics. Very health conscious, more entrepreneurial than previous generations as well. I saw an amazing statistic recently saying that half of Generation Z would prefer to go to, sorry, would prefer to start their own business rather than go to university. So perhaps for universities, there's a problem further down the line uh, unless we can motivate this generation uh, to hope for higher education like previous generations. They want the truth. This is a generation, they've been surrounded by advertising, by politicians not telling the truth all the time. They're tired of it. They don't want any more bullshit. They want the real deal. They want to know how things are and they have a nose for things which are not the truth. They, they don't have time for exaggerations, false promises, they want the truth. Now we'll come back to some of these things when we look at what they want from business events. But very importantly, this is a generation that wants to make a difference in the world, to do things for other people, to leave the world in a better place than they found it. And that's definitely something we're going to speak about in terms of business events. It begins with marketing. How do we get this generation to notice our adverts? 
for conferences, for uh, exhibitions, all this kind of business event. Um, it's hard. It's hard because getting their attention is a challenge. They're, they're surrounded by media, uh, by social media who want their attention. So we need to focus on where they are. Uh, not so much uh, Facebook, that's more previous generations. They're on Instagram, they're on Snapchat. Put your adverts there. Get their attention on those uh, forums uh, and you will get them paying attention to your messages. Uh, they want content. So there's no good just putting a, a bland advert saying, please come to this conference. No, they want something that grabs their attention, something that makes them sit up and say, wow, that looks interesting. So content, something, the inside story. They, they love those behind the scenes stories like uh, here's a small video of the conference organizer choosing the wines for the dinner. A wine tasting that's fun that's you know even if it's two minutes it's something they will enjoy it will get their attention exclusive information from behind the scenes testimonials from previous participants you know they listen to each other much more than they listen to us if you're a conference organizer they know it's your job to say nice things about the conference but they will listen much more to people in their generation who have already been to such a conference and enjoyed it. So testimonials, uh, a paragraph or a one minute video saying, I went last year, it was amazing, you should really go. They will listen to that. They want business events with multidisciplinary program. They're interested in professional development, of course. They are ambitious, but they're also interested in their personal development and they don't make a difference in the same way that previous generations did. They see these as part of the same thing. So they want to grow as people and they want to learn something useful. They want to be part of the show. They want interactions with each other um, and face to face exchanges. They want to be part of the show, not simply sitting passively and listening to speaker after speaker. Here is a word I want you to remember, experiences. This is a generation where everything is an experience. Everything is a show. I'll give you an example. When I was 20 something, long time ago, going for a coffee was going for a coffee. It was Scotland in the 1970s. There was only one kind of coffee. It wasn't very nice. Uh, we didn't spend much time in the cafe because it wasn't a nice place to hang around. Uh, so with my friends, we'd have a coffee and go back to the university library and do some work. These days, going for a coffee is an experience. It's a show. You go to Starbucks, for example, you have the 36 different types of coffee, you have the music, you have the Wi-Fi, you have the merchandising. It's an experience. And that's what Generation Z expects from everything, including conferences. Another word you're going to hear a lot, festivalization. Most of you have been to music festivals, you enjoy them. Well, Conference organizers should really take a few tips from those types of events, adding elements from festivals, maybe comedy, something like that. Um, and music, what's wrong with having music as part of a conference? We'll come back to that later. What do they want from speakers? Well, you know, it's going to be a tough time in the future for boring speakers, monotonous speakers, Generation Y and more, Generation Z, are looking for edutainment. Now, you won't find that word in the dictionary, but you can guess what it means, a mixture of education and entertainment. They want presentations which are useful, but entertaining, 
engaging. They want a little joke from time to time so that um, they can feel relaxed. And we all know that people learn better when they are enjoying themselves. They want high energy and most importantly of all, shorter presentations. They don't want 45 minutes and they don't want an hour and a half. So this is a long presentation for Generation Y. And I hope you'll all stay until the end. Good visuals, interactive slides, and above all, useful information. Why should they come to your conference? What are they going to hear that's new, that's useful to them, that will help them in their careers? So they also want, as I said, to contribute, to ask questions, to give their own ideas. So conferences will be much more interactive. They want networking time because they understand something very important, which is that one reason for going to conferences is to network, to make new business contacts. Give them plenty of time for that. Also, they want to explore the destination. They want to see the city. That's important to them. They're not people who fly in, fly out of the conference without seeing anything in the city except the conference center. So they want to do that. They also want to volunteer. Look at this picture. Now, these people are at a conference. They are conference participants. But it's Wednesday afternoon, it's the end of the day, and they're taking a couple of hours to do something to help local people. This is the garden of an old people's home, so a home for retired people. And you know, two hours later, they had put down nice grass, they built some benches for the old people to sit on. She's painting the wall a nice bright color. They made a difference, and especially Generation Z and Y will appreciate that. So organizers, think about that when you're planning a conference. What could be done in your city to help a charity, help disadvantaged people, maybe a small project to help the natural environment. Your younger participants will love it. Uh -huh. Okay, well, I think from what I say already, you can see I'm quite optimistic about the next generations. There is one problem though, they are not so good as their parents at networking. Speaking to people, that they don't know. I'm not sure why. It could be maybe they remember when they were small children, their parents told them, do not speak to strangers. And maybe they still think that's true. <laughs> well, now they're not children anymore. They are young men and young women in their 20s, and they should speak to strangers. If you don't make new contacts at a conference, you are not benefiting 100% from that conference. Generation Y, Generation Z need help, need encouragement to go to strangers and begin a conversation. It's not easy, but you know on the web, there's a lot of fantastic information about how to network. If you're organizing an event for those generations, my advice would be to make it a game, gamification. Give them some structure. Don't just do it the normal way, which is to say, hey, everybody, it's the end of the day. We're going to have an hour of um, networking. Go into the room. Here's a glass of wine. Oh, well, that helps. Here's a glass of wine. Go and network. It's not enough for the young generations. Give them something to do. Here's an example here from a lovely conference I went to in the Netherlands a few years ago. It was the end of the day, time for networking. And when we walked into the room to network, we got a glass of wine, of course, but also one of these or one of these. These are called nuts and bolts. Not nuts like you eat, of course, but they're used in engineering. Nuts and bolts. And the bolts go into the nuts. So it was a game. And you can see the game. They were all different sizes. And your challenge was to find the person in the room whose bolt could go into your nut. So it was the perfect reason to go to a complete stranger and say, excuse me, 
may I put my bolt into your nut? Now, it worked. We had fun. People spoke to strangers. We need more of that kind of thing. Let's look now more closely at events as experiences. How can you make them? Not simply an event, but an experience. You must do it. It's the future. It's what the younger generations expect. Those experiences must be unique, memorable, and enjoyable. And the reason is to engage your audiences, to get them committed, to get them involved 100% in your event. So how do you do it? Like this, it begins by understanding the individual participants' needs and goals. And they can be very different from participant to participant. Everyone's different. Some people come to a conference because they want to meet new people. They want to get business contacts. Maybe they're looking for a job or maybe they're looking to recruit someone. So they come to the uh, conference for that. Other people want knowledge, ideas, solutions. Everyone's different. You need to find out from each participant why are they coming. And then create that journey like this, like you can see um, in front of you. It's a journey going from awareness of the conference. Okay, they've seen your advert. Consideration mm, will I go? To this conference if they do they register then they attend physically and then they either never come back or they do and if they do you have retained them so it's a something that we are looking at more and more and we call it the delegate or the participant uh, journey and you can see here the different stages of that journey now the other word i mentioned festivalization and here are some of the things you can add to a conference or an exhibition to make it more of a festival. Comedy, celebrities, great food, even movies, and so on and so on. Bringing the best thought leaders, the leaders, the gurus, the experts, make it unique. Tell them this is their only opportunity to hear from these people. Um, while having a fantastic time. Look at festivals, what can we learn from them? Now, uh, we don't have time today, but here is a lovely venue, which is about one mile from where I'm sitting in North London. It's Alexandra Palace, one of our most beautiful um, venues. And this is, was a conference a couple of years ago for ASOS. Now, those of you who like buying clothes online will know this company. They, they sell clothes on the Internet. Um, when you get an opportunity, check it out and see what you can do to make a conference more like a festival. Festivalization and personalization. Tailoring experiences, everything to the individual, from how you market to the content and the networking. People like this. They don't want to be a number. They don't want to be participant number 162. They want to be themselves. They want to know that you have understood their motivation for coming to the conference and that you are treating them as individuals. Again, how to do it? Data. Get to know them. You know, when people register for a conference or an exhibition, then there are always questions you can ask them. Um, why are they coming? What's important to them? Have they been before? Well, you should know that anyway. Find out about them as people and their motivation for coming to the conference. Even speak to them. It doesn't do any harm. Personalize the invitations. You know, if I get an invitation saying, um, Hi, Rob, this event is just for you. Well, I'm going to open that email more than if it just says, dear sir or madam, this is, this is for you. So personalize it or even try to use something different. The post system. You know, when did you last get an exciting letter in the post? Well, that gets someone's attention. 
we're going to say something about apps because conference apps are very exciting and have changed conferences very dramatically and they can be used to personalize uh, delegates agendas and even to match delegates with others when it comes to networking you know how do you know if you're in a group of 2000 participants how do you know the people that you should um spend time with the people that you should go and speak to because they have the same interests as you or they are interested in the same kind of research as you it's difficult but with apps, if you have told the organizers why you are there and about your own interests, apps can matchmake. They can pair you up. They can tell you when someone that you should really meet is two meters to the front of you. Go and say hello. They are very clever things. And we'll come back to apps a little later when we look at technology. But we're going to look at something else, which is a way to make meetings more enjoyable, um, more immersive, and more memorable for the participants. And that's the five senses. Now, traditionally, um, for meetings, conferences, we've used the two senses more than any others sight and sound, vision and hearing. And you can tell that because we speak a lot in events about AV, audiovisual. And that makes sense because approximately 80% of all the information that we have about the world uh, comes through our ears or our eyes. But modern conferences, try to do more than that and try to use all the senses to make the experience more of an experience. It's based on neuroscience and cognitive psychology. And those scientists tell us that the more you stimulate the brain, the more parts of the brain you activate, the more memorable and vivid, exciting the meeting experience will be. And we want it to be exciting. We want it to be memorable. We want the participants to absorb the information, absorb the messages from the speakers and remember it. And most importantly, using five senses is a way to create excitement. And this word again, I'm sorry, engagement. If people are not engaged, they are wasting their time. And if you forget everything else, I say, Today, please remember this. Professor Domazio, push it like this. We are not thinking beings that feel. We are feeling beings that think. Now, the, these simple words tell us a lot about the importance of the five senses and feeling. And mankind, primitive man, had feelings long, long time before he could think and speak. He had feelings, fear, hunger, sexual desire. These things are much, much older in us than speech and rational thought. So what can we do? Well, a tip is this to see your event as a theatrical production, like a show in the theater. What will the participants see, hear, smell, taste, and touch during the event? Now, the way to do that is what the Americans call a sensory exposures audit. That means Going on that journey that your participants will go on, what will they hear, sell, smell, hear, touch, and taste during the event? And are those pleasant sensations? Maybe yes. Maybe the first thing they smell when they come into the venue 
is uh, the morning coffee. Great. Everyone likes it. But maybe it's something else. Maybe it's the, the, the damp carpet because it's, it's been raining. Uh, that's not a nice smell. Maybe the, maybe the first thing they hear in the venue is the traffic noise or men working in the road outside. Again, no, that's not good enough. You need to move to uh, a different part of that venue. You need to know in advance, will there be people working in the road? So walk the walk. What will they, what senses will they have during the event? And how can you make those senses positive and memorable. Now, I want to look at the five senses one by one, beginning with the two normal ones for events, audio and visual. And we've got them actually quite well. You know, um, audio is so important, especially for big events. You need good acoustics. Um, you need to make sure that the people in the back row can hear just as well as the people in the front row. So technology helps us a lot um, with that. But I think we could use sound even more. And one way that people are experimenting with sound now at conferences is through music. Ask yourself, what is the soundtrack of this event? This goes side by side with festivalization, of course. But for example, entrance music. As people are walking in to the conference room, you know, if it's going to be a if it's going to be a stressful meeting, people are very tense about what's going to happen in the next eight hours. Well, some relaxing, cool music to calm them down would be appropriate. Or if it's going, if you want to get them stimulated and excited about the day ahead, well, some loud military marching music would put them in the mood. You decide what mood do you want to, them to be in and what music works. When you give them tasks to do, brainstorming, problem solving, we all know that, you know, at home when we're doing something like that, light classical music speeds up thought. So play some music in the background. Or use those songs, which everybody knows, to match the motivation of the event. If the objective of the event is to motivate the participants, make them feel good about themselves, make them feel good about the company that they're working for, well, you know, everyone knows uh, these three songs. And don't worry, I'm really not going to sing any of them, but I don't need to. These songs are in our DNA, and they are songs which make us feel good, make us feel powerful and upbeat. On the other hand, if the theme of the conference is team building, you want people to come together, well, here are just a few examples of songs which are about, you know, helping each other, coming together, supporting um, colleagues, this kind of thing. You, you decide. You know um, what kind of music um, you like. Vision sight now most of us are fortunate enough to have our power of sight and again we use it a lot and we're good at sight we're good at the visuals powerpoint multi-screen conferences you know fireworks laser beams for a product launch we're good at visuals but again i think we could do more and what the younger gen generation tells us is that they want visual stimulation, light, color. They don't want this place, this conference room. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're from a venue and your conference room looks like this, I'm sorry. Uh, generation Y, Generation Z will take one look and walk away. And this room makes me feel very sad because when I think of all the years of my life I've spent in similar rooms, <laughs> it makes me feel depressed. No, Generation Z and Y are looking for light, color. You would much rather spend a, a nice uh, 
meeting in a room like this, stimulation for the eyes, natural daylight, you know, more like your home than a corporate box that people sit in. Another nice example. This is an old factory um, in London. It has been converted into a venue. But look at those colors. Look at that light. Look at those chairs. There are no two chairs the same in that room. But who cares? <laughs> Where is the rule that says that all chairs must be the same for a conference? There's no rule. So think about visual stimulation um, and play with color. I love this experiment. Two groups of people, same size, same people um, in each group. Two rooms, same size, but one difference. One is painted red and one is painted blue. And the two groups are given the same tasks to do. Look at this. The people in the red room did much better at those tasks requiring accuracy and attention to detail. You know, tasks of numbers, statistics, analysis, that kind of thing. But people in the blue room did better than the other group in creative tasks, needing imagination, needing solutions. Now, you're going to say to me, well, OK, Rob, this is very nice, but we can't go painting rooms uh, red and blue and yellow and green uh, according to what we want to do in them. Yes, you're absolutely right. But look, you don't have to paint them. This is the same room, different time, times of the day, and using light, they completely change the mood, change the atmosphere. So think about color. It does matter, and we know a lot more about the science of color. Moving on to the three senses that we don't use so much, and beginning with smell. It's powerful, you know? It's the only sense connected to the part of our brain that processes emotions. And our noses have very good memories. You know this from experience. If you're in a nightclub and you meet a man uh, who's wearing the same perfume as a man that you knew 10 years ago, well, you will think about that man from 10 years ago when you sense that perfume on the new man. Our noses remember, look at this. Uh, even after a year, we remember smells um, more than 65% of the time. It's a powerful sense and we can use it more. We know about the signs of smell. Our ancestors knew about the signs of smells. Lemon for concentration, lavender and orange reduce anxiety. Now, how easy is it to introduce these kinds of perfumes into a conference? You tell me, how much does it cost to slice a few oranges and put them in a nice glass bowl of water on the tables? It looks nice. It costs nothing, but it will help people to relax. So if the meeting is stressful, do something like that. Rosemary, cinnamon, each of these fragrances has its own powers. So think about the smell in the room. Or do what some venues do and create your own fragrance. There are many, many companies who specialize now in what we call scent marketing. They will create an individual perfume for your meeting rooms, your hotel. Uh, here's an example here from London. It's a unique fragrance only for this hotel, and it's a kind of mixture of grass and lemon. Very pleasant. People come in, smell, and enjoy it, and they associate that smell with the venue. Now, uh -huh. taste. Now, you know, if you're a meeting planner, how important the food and beverage is at a conference. You know if you're going to get any complaints, it's going to be about the food and the beverage before anything else. What can we do to satisfy our participants' sense of taste? Well, brain food, 
is the new fashion and the very good fashion too. We are finished with those big, heavy lunches with too much alcohol. Um, they make people sleepy. And even if they're not closing their eyes in the afternoon, they are sleeping in their heads and they're not listening, they're not remembering, they're wasting their time. Brain food, these are foods which help the participants to stay awake, stay alert. Vegetables, fruit, nuts, uh, oily fish like salmon. And if you think all that looks a little bit boring, well, may I point out at the bottom of the page, uh, black chocolate, very nice. Seriously, brain food uh, is the future. Local food, local food. What kind of food can you give them that they cannot find at home? Make it part of the experience. People like to be experimental. Uh, local food, local wine, local beers. Now everyone knows Poland, um, Czech Republic, all your neighbors, you have fantastic beers. Um, and you have food, which I've never seen anywhere else. I never saw uh, my first pierogi until I came to Poland all those years ago. But, you know, give people an experience, something different, something unique. Give them flexibility. These days, many young participant, participants are saying, no, we don't want to sit down for an hour at lunchtime with uh, you know, boring people eating the food that you put in front of us. We want just to grab a sandwich or a salad and a drink and go somewhere uh, with our friends or, or I want to have a mini meeting with a colleague. Flexibility. So we're seeing much more grab and go where people take what they want when they want it rather than formal lunches um, all the time. And finally, touch. It's a very important sense. The skin is the largest organ in the body. We're all covered in it. It's an important sense. It's particularly important to babies. And I think all of you know that babies need to be hugged, caressed, kissed a lot. That's part of their development. If you don't caress your baby and hug them enough, you know, when they grow up, they become uh, serious criminals in society. No, I'm just joking, but you know, they need to be touched. It's part of their growing up. So what can you do at a conference? Well, you can do something like this. He's having a lovely time, head, shoulders, massage during the breaks. You know, no one's taking off any clothes, but if it's a stressful meeting, this is a way to make people feel good by stimulating their sense of touch. Sitting. Well, we have a problem with sitting in, the, in our industry. People say sitting is a new smoking. We sit down too much. You know, experiment. These are stability balls. They're seats. Um, but, you know, you have to pay attention and you have to move around a bit when you're sitting on them. Again, it's a way to make the body work and to remind people that we are physical beings as well as mental beings. Keep hands busy. You know, give people something to play with on the tables. Let them scribble, doodle, because we know that many people think better. They can concentrate more if they're doodling or scribbling uh, something like this. And simple, shaking hands. It's something human, not at the moment, of course, but it's something people enjoy. Uh, it's the lowest level of uh, physical contact and the sense of touch. And we should never forget how important it is. So some suggestions um, of getting the five senses, but uvaga, 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 uh, don't, don't do too much. Do not stimulate too many of the senses at the same time. Have a reason for stimulating the senses. Otherwise, people will go crazy. We don't want, for example, loud music with strong scents. Um, don't assault the senses. Appeal to them. Be discreet. That's the way forward. Now, I said we would come back to uh, speaking about technology, and of course, that's extremely 
um, important for turning business events into experiences. Of course, one of our best friends is the social media. Uh, we use them already widely in conferences. Maybe um, some of you are old enough to remember the days when when we first had mobile phones and before the conference, the organizers came onto the stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, please switch off your mobile phones. Now, the organizers come onto the stage and say, ladies and gentlemen, please switch them on. Please tweet, please share on LinkedIn, take photos of the speakers, share them on Twitter and so on and so on. It's a way to spread the conference beyond the four walls of the venue. Hashtags. Most big conferences in the 21st century have a hashtag. That's a way to uh, monitor what people are saying about the conference. If you're the organizer, you can monitor on Twitter and other uh, media what people are saying. And if someone just, ha just tweeted saying, hey, I'm at um, Mice Day 2020 uh, and the temperature of the room is far too high, I'm going to die. Well, you can do something about it. You can lower the temperature. Follow what people are saying. If they're saying, oh, my God, this speaker is so boring, then, you know, make sure that speaker doesn't speak longer than they are supposed to. Apps. I told you we'd come back, and here are three examples of simple apps for uh, conferences. Again, many of you may recall the days when you'd go to a conference and you would get paper, 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 the program, the, the, pre the presenter's uh, presentations, the program for the evening. No, these days, no paper. It's on the app, the schedule maps of the venue, maps of the destination, the speaker's biographies, whatever, you can put it on the app. And it is becoming a powerful weapon uh, in making conferences successful. All the content, social media links, make it easy for them to do like you can see in the photo, to share in in app email systems so people can contact each other. and. Perhaps most importantly of all, the chatbots. The chatbots. Now, we are used to these, I think, from when you phone your bank and you get a machine, which sounds like a nice lady, but it's a machine. Uh, how can I help you today? Please tell us what is your problem. You know, using artificial intelligence, you can train chatbots to respond either to text or even to voices. And this is wonderful for the organizers because you know all those silly questions that participants are always asking, like, you know, what's the password for the Wi-Fi and what time do the buses leave this evening for the gala dinner and blah, 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 blah. Now the chatbot on the app can answer those questions. They're very intelligent. And so it's making life easier. Also, apps can be used to make participation easier. So instead of putting your hand up for questions and answers, you can simply uh, encourage people to use the app to type their question. And the speakers can look at the question and answer it for you. So again, it's making the participation better. We're going to see this word a lot more, hybrid conferences. Um, at the moment, of course, with the pandemic, uh, the vast majority of conferences are now online. I think that after the epidemic is over, we will see these kind of conferences, which are a mixture of face-to-face -face events and remote online events so that people in the same room, um, some people are in the same room, other people are all, all around the world, 
like you are right now following this uh, presentation. Now, this is demanding for the organizers. They need to keep the online audience involved, engaged, and that's harder when they're not in the room. So I'm crossing my fingers that all of you are still engaged. Holographic projection. Now, this is uh, an exciting solution when you want a speaker at your conference who is on the other side of the world. Now, the old fashioned way to do this was to do a video conference, put them on the screen. But in the 21st century, it's now possible to get a hologram of the speakers. This man in the middle, he's not there. He's somewhere entirely different, but his hologram is being uh, broadcast into, onto the stage of the conference. I've seen this only twice in my life. And let me tell you, after five minutes, you forget that it's a hologram. The quality is good. He's in three dimensions. And you just forget much better than having a, uh, a, a flat screen with his uh, image on it. Again, on the right, you can see the man on the right is there. And the man on the left, he looks a, bit, a little bit like a ghost. Um, he is somewhere else, but they look like they're in the same place. Hologram, we're going to see much more of that, especially if it continues to be uh, difficult to travel. I'm very excited about this, facial recognition. Now, it's important because your face is like your fingerprint. It's unique to you. The spaces between those points, the space between your eyes, between your nose and your mouth, this is a unique fingerprint of you. Once again, using our friend artificial intelligence, we can use this in check-in, registration. You know, when you come to a conference, if your first experience of the conference is waiting in a line for 20 minutes to get your badge, well, you know, that's not a good experience. It's not a good part of your journey. But you don't have to wait in line anymore because of these machines. It works like this. Days before the conference, you, the participant, upload your photo, head and shoulders, to the system. So when you arrive at the venue, all you do, look at the camera, the camera recognizes your face and prints your badge. It's better security because no one can pretend to be you and get your badge. But most importantly of all, it's faster. Data protection means, of course, that the conference organizer has to delete your image after the conference because you know if they don't it's like keeping your signature and you know how people could misuse your signature if they had it but uh people are very excited about this facial recognition for conferences and finally this is i think the most exciting of all biometric scanning biometric scan now what is it it's to get feedback from the audience now if i was in the room with you today if i was there in wroclaw with my dear students and i was teaching you i always want to know are they listening to me are they uh, are they engaged with my lecture are they are they having fun as well are they are they amused um now it's difficult to know that by asking them in a questionnaire after the lecture or after the conference it's too late then it's too late but now with artificial intelligence you don't have to wait because it works like this you put a you put two cameras at the front of the room facing the audience and their faces are scanned every second and the system analyzes those expressions 
and can tell the difference between people who are listening or not listening they're bored people they're looking depressed they're looking happy like these happy people the, the biometric scanning can tell us that in real time and again if you're the organizer it gives you data you will have a real-time record of how people responded to the speakers the messages were they engaged, were they entertained, were they bored, looking at their phones. It's very exciting. And I think that we'll see um, more of this. There's no data protection problem here because the machine doesn't know who you are, doesn't know your name. It, we don't care who you are. We don't care about your name. What we care about is your expression on the face. That tells us how the audience is responding. So again, something uh, exciting. Attendee tracking. Again, using the app, this makes it possible to track people in the conference, in the exhibition, which, uh, which stands are they visiting? Which sessions are they going into in the conference? How long are they spending there? Who are they speaking to? Are they networking a lot or are they on their own for a lot of the time? Attendee tracking gives us the power to tell where people are at any time. Now, I'm not going to say more about that because I want the last part to be about venue design and how that is changing. Look at this beautiful 21st century conference venue. How are venues changing? Well, the first thing we notice is the diversity in the supply of venues. Traditionally, conferences have been in conference centers, hotels, maybe universities, but that's changing fast. This is a conference, but it's a conference in a, in a museum, in an in aeronautical museum. And you can see the ladies and gentlemen are listening to speakers, but at the coffee break, in the lunch break, they'll be able to walk around, look at the planes, sit in a helicopter. It'll be fun. I don't know what is the theme of this conference, but you know, if it was something about aviation, I wouldn't be surprised in the least. Museums, tourist attractions, monuments are opening their doors more and more to conferences. Here is the lovely Hydropolis in, uh, in Wroclaw, and you can see uh, by day it's a tourist attraction. I really, really want to go there. My sign of the zodiac is Aquarius, the water carrier, so that place is for me, really on my next visit. But look at the photograph below. In the evening, it's being used for a conference. I don't know the theme of the conference, but hey, maybe it's something to do with water. That would be fun. But it's typical of the kind of tourist attractions opening their doors to conferences. Clients are becoming more demanding. They want the venue to be much more than simply four walls and a roof. They want it to add value to their meeting. Let's look at how that can be done. Now, I know that you all love books, and this one is my Bible. Uh, Adrian Seeger, a British guy, but in America, um, wrote this book a few years ago. Now, he's not a conference professional. He, he was a scientist, and he was going to a lot of conferences, and his conclusion was, you know, I'm wasting my time at a lot of these events. And he wrote this book about how we can organize them better. Now, one thing Adrian said is this, adults learn in a different way to children or even to students. 70% of adult learning is social learning, learning from each other, learning from their peers, their colleagues, their competitors even. At conferences, you will see 
a lot of what you learn is not so much from the speakers, although they are important, but from each other in the coffee breaks, in the lunch breaks, at the bar in the evening. Learning from your uh, colleagues, new solutions, new ideas. 20% um, self-directed, reading, reading blogs, reading books. And only 10% of adults learning is formal learning, sitting, listening to um, a speaker. It's very different to children. Now, if this is the way adults learn, then we need spaces in venues where participants can go and have those mini meetings, one-to-one, one-to-two, two-to-two meetings with each other. They don't want to have those meetings just in the corridor. They want somewhere comfortable where they can relax. Look, something like this. We call these pods and they're fun places for, for meetings. You know, if you're sitting there, people won't interrupt you because they see that you're having a meeting. They're fun and more and more venues are putting them in. Here's another example here. They're not closed boxes because no one wants to sit in a closed box, but they're fun. They're semi-open for private meetings. Flexibility. Very important. Um, and one part of that is the seating. Conference organizers love flexible seating so they can form groups, unform groups, reform groups differently between participants. We'll look at an example in a minute. But comfort as well is important. And choice, look at this. This is a conference room in a Marriott hotel. And well, three, four different types of chairs. You walk into the room. If you want to sit with a friend on a, uh, a sofa, do that. There's garden furniture. There are individual chairs. There are even bean bags at the front of the room. Why not? It's fun. It gives you choice. Conference planners love these seats. They're flexible. They're movable. Um, we're going to see them more and more. And of course, some universities have them. On the stage as well. You know, the old way of just one speaker speaking for an hour, uh, that's changing a lot. We're seeing a lot more of these chat show, talk show setups, where the, the man in the middle is interviewing the other two men. It's more relaxed. It's more normal. They're still giving him and the audience information, but it's in a different way, which is much more accessible. Oh, well, I know we're, uh, many of you are in Wroclaw and not Krakow, so you're going to hate me for saying this. But um, one of my favorite venues in uh, Poland is this one right here, the ICE uh, in Krakow. For me, it's what a 21st century venue should be like. Lots of natural light, space. And look, when you look through those windows, you see the beautiful castle on the other side of the river. Go to this venue and you know you're in Krakow. You look outside and you see Krakow. So beautiful 21st century venue in Poland. But don't worry, Wroclaw, because my favorite 20th century venue is right there in your city, the Hala Stuletia. Moving on, uh, sustainability. Now, it's important to the young generations, good it should be. We're seeing venues becoming greener. Look at this. This is the Montreal Convention Center. And on the roof, it's a garden. Fruit, vegetables, they have bees. And here's the chef picking some herbs for the lunch that day. It's green, the plants provide insulation, so you're spending less on heating and uh, air conditioning in the summer. Venues are becoming greener. Another 
example here, the kinds of things that venues can do to be green. And if you are interested in looking at your venue and making it greener, look at the Green Venue Report. It comes out every year and it's full of wonderful ideas that make you more sustainable. Uh, and many of those ideas also save you money. Finally, wellness. It's incredibly important, of course, and participants, especially younger ones, are asking more and more that you take care of their well-being, their wellness, um, as well as their minds. When they come to a conference, look after them physically. A um, couple of examples here. If your venue has outdoor space, for example, a terrace, a garden, even a balcony, well, use it. Let them go out. Let them go out and work in small groups if that's what you want them to do. Nature helps us to concentrate, gives us energy, wakes us up. You know, give them an exercise break. Let them walk around the venue outside. That is going to wake them up much more than cup of coffee number six of the day. So we need to think much more about participants' wellness. Um, part of that, of course, is what we've already spoken about, brain food. But give them not only coffee, or coffee makes our brains very dull. Give them stimulating water, herbal teas, fruit juice, sparkling drinks. That will make them much more mindful. And again, multimodal design. I love this quotation from the Professional Conference Management Association. Participants are looking for spaces designed for different needs. Wellness rooms, quiet workspaces, intimate settings like those pods, and loud, exciting spaces. Um, you know, every different space to be used at the right time and for the right purpose. This is the future. <laughs> if you're going to read two books this year, well, this is my little uh, reclama. Um, many of the ideas I've been sharing with you are in business events by this guy, Rob Davidson, whoever he is. Uh, seriously, if you are in our industry already or planning to come into our industry, please um, think about looking at this because I'm very proud um, of the, the research uh, in this book. And most importantly of all, I want to say a very big uh, thank you to all of you. Um, here's the most important piece of information of all, Rob's email. Um, you know I do like to uh, stay in touch with people. For me, it's always a pleasure to hear from people working in our industry. Um, so please, uh, keep in touch. Uh, we, we've been speaking a lot about networking. Well, of course, we have. LinkedIn. Um, if you're not on LinkedIn, by the way, well, <laughs> why not? Um, an excellent way to uh, to keep in touch. So I'm going to uh, cross my fingers now that the technology will work. I'm going to stop sharing this presentation and hopefully come back to you. Um, Streamyard. Oh, no, sorry. You can tell Rob and Rob and uh, technology do not go so well together. Okay. Let me see. Let me see. Welcome. While I'm doing this, ladies and gentlemen, please um, ask you to type out your uh, questions uh, using the, the right hand side. Um, let me just go back to where I was for. Q 
screen. Okay. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me now and see me. It says I'm in the show, so I suppose that means uh, that I am uh, in the show. Um, so it's over to you now. Once again, thank you very much for all your your patience. And and I'm just looking at the comments um, already. You are such kind people. Hello, Tamara. Oh, hello, Pavel. It's uh, fantastic. Uh, I feel like I'm already in, uh, back in uh, in Wroclaw. Um, so thank you all so much. I really appreciate your comments, Marta. You are really uh, too kind, uh, and I'm really uh, flattered by all your lovely uh, contacts um let me see just if anyone has a question um because uh <laughs> sorry i i'm laughing at adam's comment about we like each other there's no competition between uh Wroclaw and and krakow so i'm really happy to hear that because they are both um incredible incredible cities all polish cities um are great so um it's just a case of looking through your comments now uh oh thank you damien that's a, an interesting one and percon i didn't know that one um so something new to uh, look forward to um in the future generation alpha <laughs> no i'm super excellent so uh i don't see any particular questions so with your permission i'm going to just spend a little time uh, speaking to you all about something which we cannot ignore, which is the the pandemic and what's happening at the moment. So I'm I'm here in London. I'm I'm at home. Uh, I hope you like my house. I I cleaned it specially for uh, for you today. Um, I'm looking outside the window and I'm seeing something which I haven't seen for a long time, which is a clear sky i see maybe one maybe two planes a day which of course is very very different um the pandemic has touched everyone's life um and we are all waiting for the moment when we can get back to something that looks um quite normal now in the past week i've done um three different presentations um looking sorry i mean web webinars and they have all been about um covid19 and the impact of the epidemic on our industry <sighs> naturally it's not a good impact um i think that we are a, a, a victim of the epidemic and will continue to be until people get confidence again until people feel confident to to travel to get on a plane to be in a gathering uh, a large gathering of people the question you would like me to answer is when will that be and i'm really going to disappoint you now it's really i don't believe anyone who says they know when that moment will be we can prepare for it or we should pre prepare for it but at the moment, what we have seen is widespread switching from face-to-face -face events like normal to, to this kind of event, virtual meetings, online, Zoom, Skype, and all the rest. We've seen a lot of that. Um, and one concern I have, really, is that many companies in particular will continue even after the pandemic they will continue to use that kind of technology because and i think we need to be honest actually for some kinds of meetings it's better it's okay uh, a skype meeting uh, a zoom meeting for six people for an hour, people who know each other well, there's no need for networking, getting to know you. Yeah, okay, well, go on, have it online. And I think many companies will. 
They understand that it saves money. It means people are not absent from the office. Um, they don't have worries about uh, travel and security and all this kind of thing. We will lose some meetings inevitably. But the vast majority, we will get back. People know, people know that this kind of electronic communication has severe limitations. We would all today, this afternoon, rather be together in lovely Wroclaw, lovely Poland, having a nice time, shaking hands, hugging, having a beer, etc., etc. We would rather be doing that. It's more human. It's, uh, it's what human beings do, but we can't. At the moment, we can not. When things move on and we come to the next phase, I think we will begin to see that companies, organizations, associations will come back. There will be three phases, I think. We're in phase one at the moment where most meetings, festivals, gatherings are forbidden by our governments. The next phase will be a semi-normal phase when we are permitted to come together, to meet, but with uh, measures, um, social distancing measures, hygiene will be extremely important, keeping the venue clean four or five times a day, surfaces, sterilized this will be i'm afraid part of our life for some time we're going to see when you arrive at a hotel already some hotels are doing this receptionist will be with a mask on airlines protective clothes for the air hostesses air stewards it would be nice we understand why it will be happening, but I think we'll be sad that we have to have this. But, and then the next phase will be a return to normality. And when that will be, we'll all be extremely happy um, to get back to normal. Although these are just my ideas. These are, this is not based on research, but I think we will never get back to being the way we were before. Not, not exactly. And it may be a good thing. You know, I think this period has told us a couple of important things. And one thing is that we all, we're all important to each other. We understand now that many of the most important people in our society are people that we didn't even notice much before, people working in supermarkets, people driving buses, our nurses, you know, those people, we depend on them so much now for some type of normality. I think that we will not return quickly to very extravagant meetings. No, spend, 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 big budgets, champagne, five-star treatment, clearing this public beach so we can use it for our incentive travel group. I think we will be more careful about wildly extravagant spending. It won't be flavor of the year. Uh, companies, I'm sure, will not feel extravagant. Many companies, sadly, will go out of business and they won't come back. The companies who survive will not be in a mood for extravagant spending. I think that will be a change. I think we'll see more of the kind of corporate social responsibility type of elements that I talked talk to you about in the lecture. Doing more for local communities, for a charity, uh, painting a school. Some of you will remember a very nice MPI conference in Gdansk a few years ago when uh, the organizer 
Anya Gorska. Hello, Anya, if you're there. Uh, she asked every participant to bring a toy, a doll, a game, something for children. And I remember oh, there were hundreds of toys and she donated them to a local orphanage, a place for children with no parents. It was a nice thing to do. It was something from the heart. And I think our industry in the years to come will be under pressure to show that we have a heart as well as a head. So more of that. The only winner in this terrible, terrible time is the environment. Clear skies over Beijing, clear skies over some of the most polluted cities in the world. Why? Well, of course, we know why. Factories have closed. Traffic is way down a fraction of what it was before. The, you know, the air is purer. We can, I can tell it when I'm walking around London. The, the environment has been the winner. And again, I think we will see much more attention to our natural environment and much more pressure to make sure that our events respect sustainability. I think that will be a trend which will, uh, which will not go away. I think that association conferences, you know, those big hundreds, thousands of participants, I think many of them, when they come back, will be hybrid. Sure, there will be members of the association in the room. Good, that's what we want. But there will be others all around the world who won't travel or can't travel, and they will follow it uh, online like this. Remember, people will not feel rich. Many people have lost their jobs. They've had their salaries cut. They have lost income. And so many people may say, well, you know, I always go to my my association's annual conference, but not this year. I will follow it online. So hybrid version will be something that um, that is useful. Um, what else can we say? Nobody knows. Um, we are waiting for our scientists to to do their job and to find some solution. Uh, I did a podcast uh, last night, midnight, uh, to uh, a Brazilian organization. So midnight in London was uh, eight o'clock in the evening in Brazil. And the question I got there was, tell us about medical meetings, scientific meetings. When will they come back? And my guess, my answer is that they will be the first to come back. Now more than ever, scientists need to speak to each other. <laughs> and we know what they're going to be speaking about for the foreseeable future. They need to not only speak to each other, they need to make connections, to study pandemics, to do what we can, to prevent them in the future, to manage them better. So we will see those scientific meetings coming back among the first um, when things begin uh, in the second phase when people are permitted to travel. There are some positive signs already um, for the exhibition industry, for example, well, already China, one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest uh, exhibition destinations in the world has already opened its doors uh, its exhibitions, and just last week, very uh, exciting, Germany, you know, the world's biggest destination for international um, exhibitions, the German government said that they would not count exhibitions as mass 
gatherings. Mass gatherings are, you know, rock concerts, um, people gathering for uh, worship in a big church. No, those are not possible. Those are verboten. But they have I decided that um, exhibitions, trade shows, Mesa are a different category and that it is going to be possible to have them with social distancing. And, you know, we have social distancing in our supermarkets. So it's easy to see how an exhibition could do this, limiting the numbers, limiting the number of people who come to your stand at any, um, any one time. So that's good news for that particular sector. Sorry, but I do think incentive travel will be the last type of mice event to come back. People will not be motivated to work hard to win uh, an exotic trip until they are 100% sure that it's safe to travel and that the country they are going to will be safe, hygienic. So to finish off, ladies and gentlemen, I think we can look forward to seeing mice events recover first at the local level. So companies having conferences in, in a local hotel, a mile away from, from the headquarters of the, of the laboratory of, of the company. Second thing, national com companies, associations having their national events. And then Finally, international, because we do not know yet what governments are going to do about uh, quarantine, for example. Our government is just announcing that to come to the UK, you need to be for two weeks in quarantine at the same address before you can go, go around. Well, two weeks is no good. If you're coming to the UK for business, you want to fly in uh, and do the business and then um, fly out again. So those are Rob's predictions and time will tell. Most importantly of all, um, you stay safe and stay healthy and, uh, and stay positive. Stay positive is very important. You've been extremely um, patient and now I'm going to give you a little um, reward. I'm going to turn my laptop around and I want you to see what I can see from here uh, for just a second. There we go. That's the view from my window. I hope you can see it. That my house looks exactly like the one over there. That's my neighbor. And I hope you can see my beautiful, beautiful boat because um, I like to uh, collect those boats. I find them really attractive. That one was from, um, was from Thailand. Right, so I promised I would stop speaking at uh, half past five my time, half past six uh, for uh, most of you. So once again, Jin uh, Kuyabarjo, thank you very, very much and hope to see you soon uh, in person. Take care. See you. Bye bye.